claims of hacking. Iran specifically seems to have advanced their efforts. And false accusations of campaign crowds generated by AI. Are you worried at all about the size of Harris's crowds? Oh, give me a break. In history, for any country, nobody's had crowds like I have. So how do we know what's real on the road to the White House? We have a long way to go in this election. This is CBS News Bay Area with Elizabeth Cook. We know in any election season there is the threat of misinformation. But with technology advancing and the growing use of AI, how do we know what to believe? Well, we're going to talk to a UC Berkeley expert on this coming up in just a few minutes. Cybersecurity is top of mind on the road to the White House, and so are the roles of AI and social media. Our Ann Makovic is following this all for us. and Yeah, and a warning today as the technology gets better, we could be seeing more doctored photos and uh, potentially uh, cyber attacks releasing proprietary information as we get closer to Election Day. Uh, case in point, the most recent example, former President Trump's campaign says it was recently hacked. It's blaming Iran for gaining access to what appeared to be its research on Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance. That material was sent to Politico and the Washington Post in late July from an anonymous email account. CBS News cybersecurity analyst Chris Krebs said on Face the Nation that more cyber attacks are likely. We have a long way to go in this election. Uh, Iran specifically seems to have advanced their efforts, moved them to the left perhaps a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Russia enter the fray soon. Now, Trump also falsely claimed that Vice President Harris used artificial intelligence to fake pictures showing large crowds at her rallies last week. But CBS News was one of several news organizations on the campaign swing and verified crowd size estimates were, in fact, accurate. Now, Mr. Trump also returned to X for the first time in nearly a year, posting a video ahead of his conversation today with Elon Musk. The Tesla and SpaceX owner endorsed Trump for president shortly after a gunman tried to assassinate Trump at that campaign rally in Pennsylvania last month. Musk said that his conversation with Trump is going to be unscripted and that no subject is going to be off limits. Meantime, Harris's campaign says that she is working on some of her economic policies right now. Those are going to be made public later on this week. And as for her VP candidate, Tim Walls, he's going to be in Los Angeles for his first solo campaign event. He's going to be speaking with the labor union, which is, of course, a key demographic for the campaign. Back to you, Liz. All right, Anne, thanks so much. Still ahead, we're going to talk to a UC Berkeley professor about the use and threat of artificial intelligence in the upcoming election. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Vice President Kamala Harris is back in Washington a day after a quick campaign stop here in the Bay Area. Ardalan reports billionaire techies and other Democrats donated millions of dollars at a fundraiser. He also spoke to some of her longtime political allies. It was an event of who's who at the Fairmont Hotel. A lot of tech billionaires, CEOs, and politicians, from Governor Gavin Newsom to State Senator Nancy Skinner to Latifah Simon, who's running for Congress. Incredibly exciting and inspiring and kind of surreal, right, to those of us who've known Kamala for a long time. And those who've been on the journey, a lot of us haven't seen each other in a long time. So it's kind of like this big reunion and homecoming. Old friend Steve Phillips has known Harris for 25 years and supported her in the San Francisco district attorney race and the state attorney general seat. To be able to see her, we haven't seen each other in years, the warmth in her eyes and the greeting. And so in this context, it was actually very, very moving. He says there's a sense of pride for him and many old Bay Area friends to see Harris running for the presidency. 
The room was very full wow. and uh, very enthusiastic. And uh, it was, well, this is, this is a home turf. Organizers say about 700 people attended the fundraiser. Ticket prices started from $3,300 to half a million dollars. You're telling me you don't have a half a million dollars to go inside? <laughs> I wish I did, but you know what? I just want to get a glimpse of her and show her that I'm supporting her. How much did it cost you guys to go inside? We mm -hmm. went out the cheap Baja seats. <laughs> we had the, we had but, the red the red blade bracelet on. But right. I'll tell you, it's worth not going on vacation. Her campaign confirms no running mate Tim Waltz, just Harris in the Bay Area after the two had gone on a lengthy campaign tour in battleground states. Organizers say Harris talked to supporters for 30 minutes. Nancy Pelosi introduced her and then she recognized Gavin Newsom and I think she spoke very much from her personal roots that they were elected together in San Francisco 20 years ago. And also they were behind yeah. the, the change in gay rights that started here and speaking to how that's under attack. She covered Roe versus Wade, she covered economics, she covered domestic issues. Supporters and old friends say Harris has re-energized the Democratic Party. Steve believes she will inspire young people to turn out in swing states. The enthusiasm is just off the charts and I'm quite optimistic it's going to propel her into the White House. Organizers say Harris raised more than 12 million dollars at this fundraiser. So the question is not if, it's how many more times will Harris return to the Bay Area before the November election. Now, with artificial intelligence getting more advanced by the day, there are growing concerns about people using it to affect the outcome of the upcoming election. Homeland Security held a hearing with a panel of experts back in May. The, the real concern is that you can micro-target, of course, precincts, you can micro-target small um, towns and cities with these AI disruptions that can have real impacts in certain states to presidential elections. And I think that's something that I think we have to really consider and think about um, as we move forward and how we get these small towns and city clerks, the, 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 the technology, but also the education that's needed to take on this, these uh, deep fakes and AI, AI concerns. Join me now is Dr. Olaf Grote from UC Berkeley. Thanks so much for being with us. Let's start with the use of AI in the upcoming election. We've seen how even tech savvy teenagers can manipulate images and data. Is there a big concern that AI could play a role in potential election interference and how can that be prevented? In fact, there's lots of concern here, Liz, as we've uh, seen uh, deep fakes in the United States take up by about 245% this year. Uh, and that's a fairly standard number for any country with elections uh, this year. In China, uh, where there is no elections, we've seen a 2,800% increase of deepfakes. So deepfakes are uh, on the rise, as it were, uh, and much to the chagrin, of course, of those who want to warn or guarantee election integrity. Uh, to your question, what can be done? Well, uh, so watermarking is one solution. Watermarking, however, is flawed because watermarks can be stripped from digital uh, uh, from digital uh, uh, output uh, from code. And so we need laws such as the ones that we have on the books currently that forbid that. We also need humans in the loop and need to make sure that uh, we have people watching over those deep fakes so we don't have them entering legitimate political campaigns. So the human in the loop, and then what I call speed bumps, right? That slow down artificially generated election content are equally important to make sure that we buy ourselves the time to intervene and do quality checks. Because it's remarkable how well AI is at doctoring images and messing with data. Is there anything that just somebody, the average viewer, the average consumer of information, either on their phones or online, anything that they can look for when it comes to these deep fakes? Well, look, I mean, sometimes you can, if, you, if you're very discerning and you look very carefully, then you can see that the mouths don't quite sync up with the narrative. Uh, most, unfortunately, most viewers of this content aren't that discerning or are too rushed to pay attention. Uh, but if you are discerning, then one thing, reverse search on Google. And if it comes up with nothing, then there's a good indicator to be skeptical.
Yeah, that's great advice. All right, let's switch gears for a second here. President Trump meeting with Elon Musk today on Musk S X, formerly known as Twitter. Both these men are hoping to get something out of this. Musk is hoping, of course, it will also help bring X back to its political roots that it had when it was Twitter. Can you tell me a little bit about what you think the the impact of this meeting will be on on this platform and the and the influence of Elon Musk when it comes to political issues? Yeah. Look, Elon Musk, I think, is doubling down on his committee on his commitment to the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, and he's doing that with uh, with Twitter while keeping Twitter uh, more relevant or making it more relevant again. Uh, Trump, of course, had, uh, you know, withdrawn into truth social. But there he only has seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 million followers on uh, Twitter. He had 88 before uh, he was uh, cut loose, as it were. And so I think for Twitter, uh, as well as Elon Musk, it's a way to uh, stay in the dialogue, in the current stream of news, keep Twitter relevant. And uh, and for Trump, it's a way to amplify his message to a larger audience. And so I think it's a, it's a win-win for those two. We'll have to see, though, whether it's a win for democracy. The European Union has already warned Musk not to, uh, uh, you know, facilitate dis and misinformation which is against the Digital Services Act. So regulators around the world are actually watching this quite closely. Yeah, I mean, that was going to be my next question. You know, Musk has made no bones about it, that he wants to see Donald Trump get elected. He's trying to essentially buy 800,000 votes, buy enough influence to encourage those people to come out and vote for Donald Trump. Do you think that he has the power to change the algorithm, that people that are using that platform will see more positive stories about Donald Trump? Oh, I think most definitely the algorithmic power is there. That algorithmic power is not just, uh, you know, there at, at X. It's there in every one of the global platforms that have a lot of followers. Uh, one slight tweak uh, or changes to the weights of these nodes and these large models can have a very significant impact on the output, on what we see. You know, whether or not that then has an actual impact on how we vote is a different story and can't always be proven. Uh, but the uh, the algorithmic power is definitely there to have us view different types of information than we otherwise would. All right. One last question. Two big ties to the Bay Area with this presidential race. You have J.D. Vance, who used to work in venture capital. Kamala Harris, of course, D.A. in San Francisco, attorney general of California. Who do you think has more sway here in the Bay Area? Look, I think the, the vast majority of people in the Bay Area vote Democratic. Um, that is not necessarily uh, the case for the centillionaires and billionaires uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, where I think it's more 50-50. Uh, but, uh, but I think clearly the general electorate uh, leans more left than right. Uh, in terms of the impact that either is going to have on Silicon Valley, I think uh, we can expect more regulation of big tech, whether it's on the antitrust fund or on uh, on privacy and agency, at least uh, the latter with, when it comes to the Democratic uh, candidates. All right, Dr. Olaf Grote with UC Berkeley. Always great to talk to you, sir. Always good to be with you, Liz. Thank you. All right, see you soon. Well, CBS is your election destination. Stay up to date with everything, including the upcoming Democratic National Convention on KPIX.com and the CBS News app. Still ahead, find out why a music superstar is slamming the Trump campaign. Celine Dion is denouncing this use of her song, My Heart Will Go On, by former President Trump, during a campaign rally Friday evening in Montana. The singer released a statement saying, quote, in no way is this use authorized, and Celine Dion does not endorse this or any similar use. And it, it ends with, quote, and really, that song? To agree with her on that one. And right now it's unclear whether the Trump campaign will stop using that song. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, hey, I'm 
I'ma keep on running Cause the winner don't quit on themselves uh, Vice President Harris did receive clearance to use Beyonce's song Freedom in her first appearance as a presidential candidate three weeks ago. We'll be right back.